Hi, everybody. Welcome to Custody Matters Live with my, I am Danica Joan and my co-host is Wendy Perry. Uh, today's special guest is Crystal Shivers. She is an adult child of parental alienation and she's going to share with us her story. And, um, and I guess let's begin. Welcome, Crystal. Thank you so much for having me. I am so glad. One thing I wanted to acknowledge you of, of it, it is not easy for a child who's gone through parental alienation to really speak out. Sometimes it's, it's a very traumatic uh, situation, especially when you realize that um, a, a parent has, has perpetrated this, and, and, and I'm sure there's feelings of betrayal of, of feeling that you were betrayed and maybe even feeling like you are betraying uh, a relationship by speaking out. So I acknowledge you for that. Thank you. No, and that has been um, a big, like if you look at how long I've had videos out on YouTube, like I put out my first video years ago, um, very anonymously, but it's, it's been out there for years and it's been this very long, slow journey for me to be able to open up more and more and share more of my story just because it's been hard to process, but then there's also relationships that you do indeed feel like you're betraying by speaking out. I, and I think it's so important that you do. And as Danica was saying, thank you so much for that because, you know, we talk about people who are experts in the field of parental alienation. And I think the best experts we have are people like you who, are, who were alienated children who share their true experiences with us. And um, I love your bio that I got from your Facebook page and your Facebook page is Kid of PAS. Um, it's short and, and to the point, I was alienated from my biological father and his family by my mother. Now I am grown and I want to share my journey and experiences with others. And so it's so important and thank you so much for, for doing that. It, and it takes a lot of courage, but by doing that, I know you help so many people. Well, thank you, thank you both. So tell us about, um, when did your mom and dad um, divorce or split up? Uh, when, when did they break up? And then at what point was their um, parental alienation starting? Yep. Yeah, so my early childhood um, was very chaotic. There was not a lot of stability. Um, my mom and dad had my older brother together uh, when they were teenagers. They had me towards the, the latter part of their teenage years. Um, and there was just, you know, a lot of drama. So um, by the time I was about two, somewhere between two and three, um, my mom and dad had officially called my that had divorced. And I know this for sure because at that point, right before I turned four, uh, my mom had remarried. So she married her I'm gonna say final husband because they've been married now for about 30 years, so I'll, I'll call him that. Um, and um, at that point, you know, we we moved from a rural rural town in Texas um, to to Dallas. So that right away kind of helped start um, the the alienation, just because you know you have someone who's. 20 years old, wants to go see his kids, but now instead of them being a couple of miles down the road, they're, you know, three hours away. Start to put that physical distance between you and your dad. Right. And, and then, so you were quite young, and then what was there, um, and I don't know what you remember because you were so young, but uh, what do you remember? Was there a, an incident um, where there was like a sudden cutoff or... Um, was it like all of a sudden your, your dad just wasn't there? How, what were the first things that you remember about that situation? Yeah, no, so, so definitely um, the first thing would be the distance. Um, and then after that, um, there was just this one day where I was, I was walking through the kitchen and I see my older brother and, and he's coming out of my mom's bedroom and he's just crying and he doesn't stop to talk to me. He runs past me to go to his room and um, 
shortly thereafter, you know, I'm like summoned to go into my mom's room for her to talk to me. And to this day, I still do not remember the, the details of that conversation, even though I can remember like what my third birthday cake looked like. I don't remember what was discussed. All I know is my life was entirely different after that day. Um, there was a little girl down the street that we used to babysit sometimes and she had a very real situation where um, her dad was molesting her and after that I have been able to sort that out that this conversation did occur after it was revealed that this little girl had been being abused um, you know suddenly my dad was an abuser like physically and also sexually um, and we we weren't allowed to to discuss the details of our abuse with each other because my mom said that that was like too traumatic for us. But, you know, she did let us know that things had happened to other siblings, um, but that we weren't allowed to talk about it. So now do you, and I'm, I'm just asking this, I don't know if, if you think this, but do you believe that the reason your mom told you kids that you couldn't dis discuss it with each other is that you might put your heads together and, and realize, oh, this didn't really happen. Definitely, 100%. Um, so <clears throat> she would just take little things and, and twist them. So like, um, as, a, as a young child, I struggled with like sensitivity to different soaps. And so like, if I would have taken a bath with like blue dial soap, that would have mm -hmm. caused me to have a allergic reaction. Sure. And so I, I remember um, being on visitation and crying because I knew and my dad was for whatever reason he just I don't know if he thought I was throwing a fit or what but he wouldn't listen to me that I couldn't take a bath with that type of soap so I was very upset because I knew that it was going to cause me issues um and so she takes that part of the story of me being upset that I'm getting a bath and then with that soap and then takes my brother's memory of like just being in the house and crystal's crying because she's getting this bath and it's like oh my gosh you were aware that your sister was about to be molested and like turns it into this whole thing but yet we're not allowed to discuss it with each other and so then years later as adults he and i finally talked about it together and we were both like i mean that doesn't make any sense but as children you know she wanted to take opportunities where she could you know try to imprint memories on us um and do that which is entirely sick and gross on her part um because you know you have to then like grow up and unpack all of this and like process it and come to terms with your whole life you thought you were sexually abused but you really weren't so it's so you did think that i mean it did Im implant those false absolutely yeah. and that was another thing that drove me nuts was that I thought because of what I'd been told that indeed I had been abused, but then like, I'm like, why can I remember my third birthday cake? But I can't remember that. Like, I just right. want to know, like, did this or didn't this happen? So then after she um, sat you and your siblings down one at a time and yep. had these conversations with you, but told you, you can't discuss this with each other. Yeah, or anyone then, else. Or, oh, okay, or anyone else, then what did she do? Because I, I know you said that she had moved and put some physical distance, but then yep. uh, after she had that conversation with all of you, was it a, like an abrupt and total cutoff from your dad and his family? What, what, did, what happened after she had those conversations with you kids? Um, after that, she started a custody battle with my half-sister's dad. So she didn't want to go after... Um, my dad's family because I think I think it's because they had a bit more money and so I think she thought that that would not be uh, where she could win but his uh, but but my sister's dad's family you know I think she felt like she could uh, probably win in that case so she started a custody battle and I think wanted to also use that custody battle to kind of detour my dad and his family from coming around as much um, and then I remember you know she would it would seem like every time around the time he was about to show up, you know, no cell phones back then, um, he would call either before he left the town that he was living in or he would call when he you know, was getting into Dallas and uh, he would just, you know, want to make sure that we're still available or, 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 you know, ready to be picked up and, you know, should pick a fight with him and um, 
he had a very bad temper, so he would just get mad and then drive all the way home. And uh, she would tell us that she'd picked this fight, so she'd let us, you know, sit outside on the front steps getting our hearts broken that, that he's not going to come by and pick us up. So, you know, there's the physical boundary, and then now the, here's the story of, well, your dad's not reliable, he's not going to come pick you up, and he's also a bad guy that hurts you. So do you really want to be seeing this person? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, you must have felt, I mean, I'm, I'm only asking, I don't know this, but I would assume that you felt kind of terrified of him at that point. I mean, did you feel really afraid of him? No, as a child, I'd never felt afraid of him. Um, to this day, I've never felt afraid of him. Um, and, and I think it's because I just, I couldn't remember anything that she was telling us about him. And around the same time that all this came out too, like we changed churches, she stopped sending us to public school, so now we were being homeschooled. So there was like all of these changes happening at once, all of our friends were changing all at once. And, and I can remember, you know, crying and um, my mom being like, why are you crying? And really I'm crying because I miss my dad but I can't tell my mom that because I know it's going to upset her. So I'm like, oh, well, I miss my friends at school or I miss my friends at church. So I knew that I wasn't allowed to be open and honest with her and also learned at an early age to hide my emotions and just not show emotion. Wow. I, it just mind blowing because when you think about like the role of a parent and, and in fact, and sometimes in these, families, these dynamics of, of parental alienation in the families, you can almost see the justification that a parent has for doing what they do, um, all, albeit <laughs> unhealthy. But in, in your story, it's like this blatant, like, um, you know, conspiracy to, to at, at all cost to, you know, to get in your heads. Um, yeah, to, I mean, yeah. absolutely. I mean, first it started out just with you, you've been uh, physically abused and physically threatened. Um, and then you've also been, you know, sexually abused. And then I don't even remember at what age this part of the narrative developed, but it ended up coming out at some point that, that he was actually part of like this satanic cult where they did awful, horrible things to children, and we were each one being groomed differently to participate in this cult as we grew up. Um, and so what it in, ended up happening was, it was like, not only was I like freaked out, at that point, yes, I was freaked out by my dad's family. I was never scared, because I didn't think they would actually do anything, but I was very freaked out. Um, but then it also, it helped too, because you know, sometime or another, in the, the mid 90s, the, the homeschool movement got really um, into their own subculture where they wanted to start like doing courtship and just betrothals and things like that. So this narrative of you were born into a cult suddenly gave her even more power and control over our lives because now we didn't even get a say in who we would date and who we would marry because they could have been sent from the cult. So we really needed to embrace this biblical courtship uh, philosophy so that the whole family could vet the person and ensure that we wouldn't be sucked back into the cult. Mm -hmm. Like it got really creepy. And so like, there was a, really creepy. She, uh, she really um, wanted to isolate you really and, and really control your environment in, in all aspects, your schooling, uh, your friendships, yes. uh, all of your relationships. Uh, keep you isolated and controlled really as a barrier to your dad and his family. Right. So, so you were um, alienated from your dad or you didn't have a relationship with him for 17 years. Yep. That is such a, such a long time. And I know we can't go over all 17 years, but what, how old were you during those 17 years? First of all, from what age to what age? And, and what was the majority of your thoughts during those 17 years? Were you, were you m missing him? Were you confused about what happened? Um, were you, did you feel sure that he didn't do anything wrong, but you just weren't sure how to handle the situation? Like, can you kind of tell us what was going on in your mind during those 17 years? Yeah. So to help tell my story, just because it, it's like such a span of time, 
on my my cover on my my kid of PAS page, I do have a timeline. So on there, I've got like 1991, last time I saw my dad as a child, 2008, reconnected after 17 years. So in 2008, I was, you know, 23 years old. Um, a lot happened, a lot transpired in the years, obviously, it's a lifetime. Um, so it was just like this constant, like, what the heck kind of thing, because it's like, you know, you're being told you're born into this cult, and so then you're like, oh, well, I kind of feel, like, lucky that I like, got away from it, so then you feel, like, happy that you're isolated and away from it, um, but then, like, you know, my mom would even, like, freak us out by, you know, oh, you know, they only drive Chevys, and they like white ones, so you should be scared of any white mm -hmm. Chevy SUV that you see, and so it's like, you know, you see a white SUV, it's a Chevy, and you kind of get, like, this ping in your stomach, like, oh my gosh, I hope it's not them coming to try to kidnap me, um, and then she would also, she would do weird things too. She would like sneak out at night and like lay a rose across the car and be like, Ooh, I bet you they can buy our house. Like you know, just anything she could do to try to keep us freaked out and disinterested in wanting engagement with, uh, my dad and his family. And then the, the way that I ended up reconnecting with him, because I know that a lot of people, you know, they wonder about that and it's so complicated so complicated but basically um also around 23 so like 22 years old i realized that i'm gay and i'm like okay this is finally i feel good about myself i feel at peace about this realization and um so i tell my brother and i tell my sister and they end up telling my mom before i got the chance to tell her so i didn't get to control the optics on that conversation um instead it was more like oh my God, like the world is over. We need to send you to conversion therapy. Like we can fix you type, type kind of thing. So while I'm in the process of seeing this therapist, it's like a theophostic counselor that's going to help me from this biblical perspective and all this. Um, I'm in complete lockdown mode. Like my mom's tracking the mileage on my vehicle. I'm not allowed to leave the house without anyone. I'm not allowed to have access to the internet or a computer without someone sitting there physically with me. Like I'm, you know, any temptation I'm not allowed to have with the outside world. Like I have to be focused on like, becoming straight again. And um, one day I have to go to therapy and nobody can accompany me. And so, you know, my mom tells me I'm tracking your mileage. I know how many miles you're going to go round trip. So if you do anything that I told you not to do, like I'm going to know. So I'm like, okay. okay, so I just, I drive there and I see, see this gas station that's on my way and they have um, a pay phone. So I get out and I had my best friend's phone number memorized and I call her and thank God she answered. And I said, uh, you know, I knew that my dad had his own business. So I knew that his name was everywhere in the town that he lived in and his mm -hmm. phone number should be out there. So I said, I need you right now to look up this name on the internet and tell me the phone number and she was like okay whatever and she does it and she's like anything else i'm like no i'll talk to you later bye and like i took the phone number and then i knew that if i rushed home i could get home before she got back home from whatever errand she had ran that day and i could call him so i did because i was like everyone in my community thinks that i'm going to hell right now no one's going to help me get out of this situation but this isn't a good situation to be in. I need someone to help me. And that was like the only person that I could think of. And I didn't know if he was a homophobe. I didn't know where he would fall on. Like I, I was just taking a stab in the dark and called the guy. You thought it was, it was worth a chance. Yep. yep. Yeah. But let me just, just try this. And then I was hoping, you know, Hey, I hope to God my mom doesn't come home while I'm on the phone with him. And I certainly hope that um, he doesn't call her and tell her that I've called. And lo and behold, he tells his mother, his mother calls my mother, and boom, they're talking. And now I'm watching my mom, and I know she's just fuming, right? Because she's like, how dare you call them? You called the enemy. That's what she kept saying. So, so there she is on the phone, and like, I'm the only one that's called. But yet she's giving an update to this woman who supposedly like has this son that's this massive cult leader and giving an update on each one of her five kids to this woman. And I'm sitting there like, if I'm in danger, I'm in danger. You don't need to give information about my siblings. 
to this woman to put us all in danger. Now, had she stayed connected with your dad's mom? Had she? I had no idea, but it was like they were friends. It was super weird. Wow. Yes. That is weird. It was so strange. And, and so, you know, my mom gets off the phone and then she starts, you know, trying to now turn all of my siblings against me because Crystal's opened up Pandora's box. Crystal's called the enemy, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, okay. And so that was like, it wasn't my light bulb moment, but it was definitely a spark to the bulb because I'm like, okay, something's not right here. Why would you share information with this woman? Why would you talk to her? And why are you now? I just, I seen it. I was just like, oh, all of a sudden you're now trying to turn all my siblings against me. So I kind of started feeling like now I was going to be the alienated. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. My yeah. goodness. So, um, so things started opening up, like layers started peeling away and uh, around this. And, and uh, just to kind of jump because of time, what, uh, how long did it take for you? Well, ha have you reestablished a relationship with your father? And, and what is it like? Yeah, so after that, I mean, obviously, it was kind of like, I can't trust you because I just called you and you've, like, had your mom call my mom. This is not, like, uh, an ideal situation. <laughs> so it, it ended up being, like, another year before I was able to talk to him again. And once again, it was because his aunt had been calling me going, hey, you know, give him another chance, give him another chance. Um, so, you know, I did. And it, it it wasn't a good time in his life. He, he had a wife that was um, very ill and she, she was struggling with cancer and whatnot. Um, but, and, and so he and I kind of like, we didn't really do much. And then I even put that on here, like in 2009, we lost touch. Fall of 2015, we were reconnected again. So, you know, we spent a lot of time um, trying to, to build a relationship and, and trying to get to know each other and it was strange because I know someone asked me once like what is that like like seeing your dad that you've not seen at that point it was now like 23 years it's like okay so what's this like seeing, seeing someone that's supposed to be so close to you and I was like do you know whenever you're out in public and you see a celebrity like alive in the, in the flesh you know and you just stare at them because it's like are they real same kind of thing it's like yeah he's not famous but to me it's like I knew he was out there I knew he existed and I'm just gonna stare at him so I did a lot of that now you knew you said you knew he had his own business his name was all over this particular town and so that sounds like you always had a curiosity about him somehow you were always kind of had an awareness of him maybe thinking about him and were you um were you seeking information about him just to kind of know where he was and what he was doing this is a question that um most alienated parents have is is my does my child really think of me are they looking at what i do online are they secretly trying to just watch me just just to have a secret connection to me so were you always thinking about him and kind of looking into what he was doing and where he was yeah i don't think there was a wasn't a day that went by that i didn't think about my dad i didn't think about the supposed situation that i was in um it, it really was kind of like being in bondage actually. And, um, I, so my mom's family actually lives like a couple of miles from him. Like they all live in the same little town. And so anytime my mom would talk to her family, they just so happened to know what was up with him and they would share an update or something like that. And then of course, yes, after, you know, um, I got a little bit older and was, you know, looking around on the internet, I would Google him. I would find out, you know, they, what's he been up to um has he had any more kids this that and another and uh, you know I looked i'd found his facebook page so yeah i mean you're curious you look sure so uh, from his perspective looking at it from his perspective was he uh had he given up on having a relationship i mean um if and i know that you this all started like in the 90s where you didn't social media was not a thing and, and right. cell phones and stuff like that. So there is that, I, I, I've got a couple of questions. With technology, there's not as much room to just like, for a parent to just disappear so much. 
Um, but, but also there's the other side of it, because he was so close, you, I, I have to wonder uh, what had him not uh, continue, you know, like keep trying to reach out to you? Or did he? Yeah, so I think with him, um, and this is like very oversimplistic, but I think that it sometimes simple works. Whatever woman he's with at the time, that's who he's preoccupied with at the time. Mm -hmm. So after he was with my mom, a woman his same age, and dealt with all that chaos, he then married a woman that was like 11 years older than him. She had three children that were like, teenagers and nine and so like it was a different focus um she was very business minded and you know they started a couple of different businesses together and like that was that was his life that's all he focused on um i also think that he doesn't have the 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 fortitude to handle um a lot of rejection and i think that he knew he was going to be rejected and he just because i've seen it now where anytime you know we've had any sort of conflicts um, he shuts down. And when what I told him is, I've said, hey, listen, you know, we're humans and we don't know each other, but we're related to each other. And I'd like to know you and we're going to have hard conversations. That's part of being a human. Uh, that's part of having a relationship. And we need to, you know, whenever it's time for a hard conversation, you don't need to call your mom and have her call me to like, tell me your side. Like we need to have this conversation. Um, so I think for him, it's easier for him to retreat and just focus on whatever woman he's with at the time. And, you know, so no, he, he wasn't very actively looking for me, I don't think. Um, I think he was happy when he got updates about me, but I don't think it was like a preoccupation for him. Wow. Do, do you wish that he had tried harder to? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, no, and that's been a big source of hurt for me is um, I, I'm like, why didn't you fight for me? Why didn't you look for me? Like, I'm your kid. And like, I found out, because I, I had this weird, rare illness as a child that almost killed me. Um, and I know he called the hospital, and I know he talked to my mom, and I know they had a fight, and that's it. But like, you knew where I was. You knew which floor I was on, like, you knew. But you never came. And then my stepsister, you know, she also had something happen when she was about 11. Um, and he knows all the details about the medically induced coma that she was in and everything. And one day when he was telling me about it, like I started crying and I'm like, why am I crying? And I'm like, oh, I'm crying because you know the details about what happened to her, but you don't know details about what happened to me because you were there for her. Why weren't you there for me? What about your relationship now with your siblings? If you want to talk about that, because what we hear a lot, um, but we don't talk about it a lot is how this really fractures um, many relationships within the family, not just you and your dad. So how has this affected, if you don't mind talking about it, how has this affected your relationship with your siblings? I don't have a relationship with any of my four siblings. And um, what just like blows my mind about it is, um, you know, the initial break in the relationship was that I reached out to my biological father. So now suddenly I was the enemy. No one could talk to me because they all sincerely believed that he was part of this awful world of cult and they were going to be like caught and tortured and all kinds of horrible things happened to them because of me. So they wanted nothing to do with me. And I, I spent like forever, you know, trying to get my brother to believe me that, hey, that this isn't the thing, like this isn't real, this is fake. And eventually he did finally come to, to Texas and he met my dad and everything, which was like a miracle. I never thought that would happen. Um, but my other three siblings just completely cut me out of their lives. Um, but my only vindication and my only like, okay, yes, in this whole situation is none of them talk to my mom either. Uh, so who's the common denominator now? You know what? It, it just struck me as so ironic that your mom had this uh, big story about how your dad was involved in a cult when in fact she actually created a cult herself, right? Mm -hmm. She had built um, a parental alienation cult is what I call it. Um, she, re she actually had formed a cult and then you broke free from the cult 
And as you said, then you are the enemy because when there is a cult like that, a parental alienation cult, you're either in the cult or you're out. You're either a cult member or you are an enemy of the cult and you became an enemy of her cult. Yep. 100%. Wow. That's exactly what was going through my head is this sounds so much like a cult and like the whole <laughs> the indoctrination, the, the taboos and, and all that around it don't don't cross that. Wow. No, like um, I actually joke around that I escaped the cult of my mother's name. And I'm like, yeah, that's, the, that's the only cult I was in and the only cult I escaped. Wow. So how is your relationship with your dad now? So like I said, every time there's a new woman, <laughs> so, um, we, we, he doesn't really reach out. And I'm just like, you know, if I'm important, you'll call me. So that's kind of where I'm at. And, and, you know, and that could be um, having, having really nothing at all to do with parental alienation. That just might be him. I yeah. think it is. That's just his personality. And right. you know, it, was, it, it was one of those things where it was, it, it was hard on me at first because, like, I took over a year after we reconnected to finally call him dad. So I'm like, I want you to kind of earn this. And then, um, you know, he decided it was time for him to get back out on the dating scene, and he did. And um, I was just like, I just don't, I'm not into this anymore. Like, you, you don't call me anymore. You don't talk to me anymore. I've planned to go see you, and you're like, hey, I'm going to go out on the boat this weekend instead. I'm like, okay, well, that's cool. So, you know, it's just kind of like, what are your priorities? Um, and obviously, I survived. And here I am. Um, maybe, I mean, not to sound like a sinner, but maybe I don't, maybe I don't need it yet. I don't know. So. Right. So, so what was it that made you want to share your story to other people? Because that is it's huge. And so what, what motivated you? What inspired you? What made you think, I want to, I want to talk about this publicly? Yeah. So when I came out as gay, it was crazy because it was like this, this homeschool community where we weren't allowed to be that, you know? And when I came out, I wasn't allowed to tell anyone, but of course my mom told her friends and they all told each other. So all of a sudden, these people, like kids, started reaching out to me because they were like, oh my gosh, there's another one of us. And like, I was that safe haven that they could talk to. And so, you know, I kind of started thinking about frontal alienation and wondering if it's like the same thing there. Like maybe there's people out there who don't know that, yeah, it is possible your kid can come out on the other side and have that moment and come to a realization and maybe maybe it'll be comforting and, uh, maybe I can help people because you know surely I'm not going to go through all of this and it you know not help someone so a question I have for you is I know your relationship with your dad has got its ups and downs and I yeah. think a lot of those ups and downs sounds like it's just his personality and your personality right. and but um are you um even with the ups and downs are you glad that you uh, reached out and reconnected with your dad? And what would you say to um, alienated kids who are maybe watching this and they're thinking, man, should I reach out to my alienated parent? What do I do? I'm scared. Right. Um, are, are, are you glad you did it? And what kind of advice would you have for kids who are thinking about that or young adults? Yeah, no, I think um, I'm 100% glad that I did it, and I would still do it again, even though it's like heart-wrenching and it hurts and it's scary, um, because you don't know until you know, right? Like, you can sit there and you can live paralyzed in fear and paralyzed just in the unknown, or you can take that leap of faith and go find out for yourself, and that's that's how I am. Like, I don't want people to tell me how something needs to be or this, that, and other. Like, I want to find my own path and I want to find my own way. And I'm much happier knowing that you know everything that my mom had told me about my dad. Like, that's not true. That's not who he is. Um, that was her toxic narrative, um, and and you know that then takes it. And it chips away also at that relationship with her. So like finally the way I left it with her, cause she'd asked me for years if I'd go to therapy with her. And I'm like, I don't know why I'd go to therapy with you. Um, but then finally, after reconnecting with my dad and kind of like letting it set in on everything that I'd missed out on, I reached out to her and I just said, yeah, you know, I would go to therapy with you. Um, if, if you're willing to first answer these questions. And I sent her a series of questions like, why did you do this? 
do you feel bad that I missed out on a lifetime of memories? This, that, and another. And um, her response was everything that I needed. She completely disregarded me, brushed me off, and was like, if this is how you want to be, this is how you want to be. And I was like, cool, got it. That's all I need from you. And that was about two years ago. All right, so uh, it's time to, to uh, tie, our time is up, unfortunately. And there's, uh, wow, I know that people are wanting more information. Maybe even you, this might have reached someone who is a child of parental alienation or is just discovering um, that they might be a child of parental alienation. So uh, could you give us your... Um, either your Facebook page or your web page so that people can find out more information? Yeah, so you can just search for me on Facebook. I'm Kid of PAS, that's three words, Kid of PAS. And then I also have the Gmail account set up. So it's uh, Kid of PAS at Gmail. I've got a few videos on YouTube, also Kid of PAS. Okay, very good. All right, thank you so much for sharing your story. and. Um, Wow, I, I do, I commend you. It takes a lot of courage to uh, stand up to that in the face of uh, possibly losing um, a relationship with, with all the people that you grew, you know, grew up and, with and loved. Yep, Thank yep. you so much. Thank you all.